So about a year and a half ago, me and my sports team went on a camping trip in Mammoth, California for some team bonding, I guess. We weren't exactly in the middle of the woods, but definitely in the woods. We were there for about four nights, and on the second night, I woke up pretty abruptly. Everyone else was asleep except me. I looked at the time, and it was something like 3.15 in the morning. I laid in my sleeping bag back for a few minutes, and shortly after I heard a sound that haunts me to this day. It sounded like a man, but it sounded unnatural. It sounded like this man, or whatever this thing was, was yelling through a tunnel. However, I wouldn't describe it as a yell. It sounded more like someone was talking. It had almost a supernatural echo to it that made me completely freeze. No animal could have had that kind of range to its voice. This noise was then followed by slow footsteps near my tent. I felt an overwhelming sense of fear, despite being in a tent with five other guys and in another six guys in the other tent. In the morning, no one else seemed to have heard what I heard, and I didn't talk about it with anybody. Not sure if it could have been a skinwalker, but any explanation would be greatly appreciated. It happened five years ago. The official ruling was that his death was caused by a rogue bear attack. You know, when a bear gets a little too used to eating human food, so it doesn't feel threatened anymore and attacks a human, they all know it wasn't a bear though. Bears don't leave wounds like that, and they sure as hell don't pose the body 70 feet up in a dead tree. Yeah, I said pose, but before I get into the details, I should explain a bit about myself now. I'm a park ranger in a very popular national park in the northern United States. I don't want to say exactly which one, although I doubt I'll keep my job for much longer anyway. That's partially why I'm posting this. I need to tell somebody else about this story, and like I said, my colleagues don't want to talk about it. Being a park ranger has given me a lot of weird stories, and everybody is used to weird shit happening in the woods. But this was on a completely different level. For days, we had been getting reports from campers and hikers about strange noises coming from a section of deep backcountry forests, growls, yipping, even human sounding voices. Equipment and food had been going missing from backcountry campgrounds. All pretty typical stuff that can be explained away pretty easily. Many animals thieve food, make weird noises, and even the human voices can be explained by the sound that foxes and mountain lions make at night. But we needed to investigate either way, because an animal that is conditioned to human food is dangerous. So, we sent our veteran backcountry ranger, Craig McKay. This guy had been working there for 30 years, was an expert outdoorsman, and was my mentor when I first started. As always, he jumped into the task, always eager to go into the backcountry, even though he was getting a little older. I'll pause now and let Craig tell the rest of the story. Well, his journal will have to tell the rest of the story because he isn't alive to tell it. I found his journal, a flashlight in his backpack inside a small cave near the location of his body. A couple of days after he didn't return and we had sent out a search party to find him. I haven't shared this journal with anyone, not even the other rangers, until now. I'm not exactly sure why I've kept it hidden other than that the truth seemed so messed up and unreal. I didn't want it to damage people's memory of Craig. I'm not even sure if I believe it myself. Everything what I'm going to read to you had written down over the two days he was out on his backcountry excursion. October 21st, 2011. Day 1. Today was a long day, and I can't say that I've made much progress. I've hiked about 15 miles over the course of the day, starting down in the gully, where the reports first started and ending up at my current camp, which is on the southwest side of Bald Knob. I figure it's a good enough place to keep an eye out for anything coming and going through the valley. Earlier, I found some tracks in the ground in the area, and as close as I can tell, they're from a mountain goat. Odd that it would travel alone, 
but maybe it was separated from its herd. Or dying? It had an odd gait. I followed them for a while, but they didn't lead anywhere, so I abandoned them. Near the tracks was a pervasive smell of death, and I'm assuming a goat got separated and died. Tomorrow, I'm planning to hike across the valley to the mountain on the opposite side and see if I can't catch a track of whatever is harassing the campers. October 22nd, 2011. Morning of Day 2. Quick note while I eat breakfast. Last night was a long night. One of the longest I've had in a while. About an hour after going to bed, I heard light steps near the campsite. I grabbed the rifle and went out to investigate. No lights, so my eyes could stay adjusted to the dark. The second I stepped out of my tent, the noise stopped. Whatever was there knew that I was watching. I made a couple of circles around the campsite and found nothing, but I could feel something watching me from the shadows. As I got back into my tent, I thought I saw a tall silhouette in the clearing, but I must have just been seeing things. It was too skinny to be a bear, and nothing else is that tall. The strong scent of death was still present and kept me wary all night. Today's mission has changed. I just got a radio call that a couple of hikers haven't returned when they were supposed to last night and might be lost. I'm still crossing the valley today, but this time to reach where the hikers were supposed to be last. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two. Stopped for the night in the valley. Cooking dinner now. Chicken and rice again. Dead tired and I'm getting too old for this. No progress on the hikers and still smells like death, though much stronger than before. I've just heard some sounds that sound like they could be voices. I can't get the radio to work in this valley. Looks like I'm not getting dinner tonight after all. Going to take a light pack and see if I can follow these voices. October 22nd, 2011. Night of day two. Second entry scribbled. Dear God, what did I find? Barely made it to this cave. I can hear it scratching and gurgling outside. Going to try and block the entrance and see if I could stay here overnight. I found out where the smell of death came from. Got the cave entrance cracked covered with a large rock and some brush. It will have to do. The beast is still outside clawing at the crack in the rock. Don't think I'll sleep tonight anyway. Not after what I saw. I might as well record this because these might be my last words. For the first time in my career, I'm scared. I don't even know what I saw. It was huge, about seven and a half feet tall, impossibly fast. Smells like putrid meat. Earlier when I had left camp, the voices outside became more and more persistent. They were definitely human voices. I followed them until I reached the clearing, and suddenly, everything went silent. No voices, no hikers. It sounded like the forest itself was holding its breath. I heard a slight sound behind me before I was thrown off my feet. Knocked the wind out of me. My rifle was ripped from my hand before I could even use it. I was picked up by my leg and thrown across the clearing. I could feel its claws digging like knives into my muscle. The thing dragged me upright against the tree, and I could feel its breath on my neck, breathing out a putrid smell. I could feel the blood pouring from my leg and soaking into my pants. The agonizing pain from the wound left me trembling. I could feel the weight of its body as it pushed up against me, ready to go in for the kill. I heard the smack of its mouth opening and prepared myself to die when a crash in the distance distracted the beast long enough for me to make a break for it. I ran for my life, and I didn't look back but knew it wasn't far behind me. About 20 feet away was the entry to this cave that I was able to squeeze into. It's still outside. I could hear it shuffling around, trying to get into the crack, and I could hear the heavy breathing, the sucking, gasping sound coming from its mouth. I have no idea what I'm going to do. 
Dear God, please help me out of this. I want to see my wife again. I want to see my kids again. My nose is filled with the putrid smell of impending death. If I make it through the night, my plan is to wait until first light and try to escape back to the ranger station. Those are the last words we have by Craig McKay. When he never reported back, we assumed his radio had gone out of range, but after a couple of days, we sent a search party to find him. Well, we found him all right. From the tracks, it looks like Craig left the cave early the next day. He makes it about 50 feet from the cave entrance when a second set of tracks catches up to him. Goat tracks. More specifically, a goat with only two legs. The gate matches something that would be a bit more than seven feet, like Craig described in his journal. What we found of Craig was dragged 70 feet up a nearby tree and torn to pieces. He was hardly recognizable. His torso was jammed onto a short branch on the tree that kept him hanging there. His arms splayed out to his sides. His innards were strewn around the base of the tree. The jagged shadow remains of his leg bones stuck out of the early snowfall that had come to the mountains this year. Nothing appeared eaten or missing, but not a single piece of him was left untouched by the monster. It took the rest of the day and a special rope team to get him down. The missing hikers were never found, though scraps of clothing matching what they were wearing had been found in the same valley where Craig died. Like I said earlier, the official story is a bear attack. Bears don't do this. We don't know what did this. We've rerouted trails to stay away from this area, but we still hear reports of human sounding voices coming from the woods, and we've had some more hikers than normal go missing in the last five years. Some are found, but it's always too late. Some are arranged like Craig was. Broken warnings to other hikers who dare intrude upon the beast's forest. Some are just never seen again. I wanted to tell you about my experience last summer. I'm fortunate enough to have a larger house and a little bit of land to go with it. So, I'm kind of an outdoor freak. Having a very successful career has allowed me to have multiple trailers and a work truck as necessary. In one of the trailers, I keep my two dogs, a Rottweiler German Shepherd mix named Yogi, and my other dog, Ralph, who's an Irish Wolfhound, two total sweethearts. I have a really nice area set up for them and plenty of food and water. They really enjoyed it in there. They usually just spend a lot of time sleeping and lounging around, but I only keep them in there when I'm gone. Whatever happened that night, whatever thing came, I believe killed my dogs and took them. This evening I was taking my woman out to dinner and a movie, and we ended up going out to the bar for a couple of beers afterward. We came back to the house really late. It was well after midnight since we left the bar around 10. As I'm pulling up the street to get to my house, I look to see some distorted torn metal on the top of one of my trailers. What the? My girlfriend actually pointed it out first and immediately said that somebody had broken in. I pulled my truck over immediately and ran up my driveway. It was worse than I thought. There were pieces and chunks of torn up metal with blood on them lying on the ground. It looked like metal pieces of a car that would fly off in the head to head collision. Mangled, bent, and destroyed. I was near on having a panic attack when I realized I didn't hear my dogs. I quickly unlocked the door and flung it open, and my heart stopped in my stomach. My dogs were nowhere to be found, but there was blood and fur everywhere on the floor, along with more pieces of bloody, shredded up metal. It reeked like wet dog, blood, and death. I look up and there's a gaping hole in my ceiling, easily large enough for Andre the Giant to fit through. It was a mess. I had a mental breakdown. My girlfriend was freaking the hell out, crying hysterically. So I called the police and told them that there was a break-in and my dogs went missing. I was panicking so hard on the phone with the 911 operator, she could hardly understand me. A cop came pretty quickly 
and I showed him what happened in my trailer, and told him I had no idea what happened. I just don't understand why there's no signs of my dogs anywhere, just tufts of their fur and blood. I didn't even know if it was their blood. What the hell kind of animal is strong enough to tear into a trailer, grab two large dogs, kill them, and eat them, and then leave? If that is what happened, I didn't know. I'll never forget the look on his face when he took in the scenery inside the trailer. He went pale and started acting really nervous. He was stuttering and being really fidgety and told me he needed to step away real quick and make a quick phone call. He was on the phone for about 10 minutes when he comes back to tell me he's going to take some information down, but it was probably just a bear who broke in and was hungry. I flipped out on him, telling him what kind of bear rips through the top part of a metal trailer and devours two large-sized dogs. He never gave me a direct answer, just ended things with, I'm just going to write this down as a bear attack and you need to be careful next time, bullshit. I never heard anything else from the police department. His tone and demeanor scared me when he was taking down notes. It's like he knew something and he kept telling me it was just a bear and that I shouldn't worry. Although he and I both seemed to clearly understand, it was impossible for a bear to have done this magnitude of damage. I didn't get any sleep that night, or for the next few. I had just got rid of the trailer within a week and had it scrapped. I did put up flyers though, hoping somewhere my dogs would show up, but they never did. It was pretty traumatizing what happened to me. I'll never forget it. What I still don't understand is with that kind of carnage, the police would have, should have done more. I don't know what to think. I believe there is a dogman killing all my pigs, and I have no idea what to do about it. I have a little house here, out in the backwoods, and my husband and I own several acres of thickly wooded game land. I love having this area because I love to raise and rescue pigs in need. I have downsized in the past couple years and, until recently, only had a litter of six young pigs. They have a good sized pen out back and I let them out every day in free roam. It's been exceptionally warm for winter this year, so I've been letting them out more and more every day. Now they're all dead. I suspect it might be a dogman or a possible Bigfoot taking my pigs. I don't know what other conclusion to come to. No other known predator does what it did to my pigs. About a month prior to now, I had noticed two of my pigs missing from the litter. This was odd. It's impossible for them to leave their pen. There is no way they can get out. My heart was racing. I thought someone had broken in and stole two pigs out of my pen in the night. I didn't even hear anything, not once. I am a light sleeper, so I would know if something was going on with my pigs. As I was walking away from the pen, going to look for them, I noticed a faint trail of blood that led off towards the woodline. I expected the worst. A bear or something probably got to them, I thought. I approached the woodline, and not even 10 feet, I saw both of them, hanging 30 feet up in a big fir tree. They were disfigured from being smashed against the tree, their intestines strewn throughout the branches they were on, and blood had drained from them entirely. Blood was all over the base of the tree, with blood running down the tree from the scene of gore above. The sight alone made me wretch right there on the ground. I knew we had a cougar or bear that was doing this. When my husband arrived home later from work, I had him investigate the mess, and he looks at me pale as a ghost and says no cougar or bear are going to store their food that high in a tree, let alone kill the pigs the way it was. My husband, partially climbing and using a ladder, got both of the bodies down to bury. It was worse than I thought. It looked to be that these pigs were slammed up against the tree so hard they popped. The amount of force these pigs were killed with was disturbing. Both eyes on both pigs looked to be popped out from pressure. Some even had teeth missing. Their torsos were completely blown out and smashed. We looked closely and couldn't find any signs of them being eaten on. 
Even the tree base that was soaked in blood looked a little deformed from how hard these pigs were thrown up against this tree. What kind of predator does that to its prey? My husband and I were scared shitless. I needed to find out what we were dealing with. We set up game cams all around the pen and bear traps disguised under brush. The next few nights were uneventful. I mourned the loss of my two piglets, but continued to take care and love the other four. I kept a pistol holstered to my hip and my husband's rifle right by the door. I began to not get good feelings being outside, constantly felt watched and observed by someone. I would look around, even sometimes grabbing my husband's rifle with the scope and searching around, just to see if I could see something. I never did see anything, but the feelings were still there. Things continued like this for about ten more days when I came out the next morning to a gruesome scene. The door that was on the pin was torn off and thrown away about fifty feet from the pin. The actual metal gating of the door was torn. Blood, guts, and pieces of what was left of my four pigs laid all over the place. It looked like a slaughterhouse. I sobbed so hard. I screamed and cried for my husband to come home and that we were in danger. Keep in mind the ominous feelings never ceased. My husband came home and about shot himself at the sheer amount of blood and gore in the pen. He was scared and kept telling me no animal does this. Those pigs weren't even eaten. They were just torn into shreds. Again, I never heard anything while I slept during the night. This was done silently. My husband called the police. An officer arrived and took a look at the scene himself, told us this was a bear attack, that we were irresponsible enough to leave food out to attract a bear to lead to this and left, told us not to call the police again and waste their time over trivial affairs. My husband was so angry he got into it with a cop for a good five minutes and almost got himself arrested. That's a whole other story. I never recovered from losing my pigs, and my husband and I have no idea what it could actually be, but I have my ideas. I spent some time doing homework and trying to find out what attacks livestock and kills like that. I somehow stumbled upon Bigfoot. I haven't put much thought into the whole Bigfoot idea, but after listening to multiple stories involving Bigfoot and animals, it seems like these things take animals. Then, I ended up hearing about Dogman and listening to that. I checked out several different videos of these stories, some of them actually being yours, and I had no idea these things kill like they do. I'm beginning to worry that the feelings of being watched and our pigs going missing is a sign they are in the area. My husband doesn't believe it, and I can't entirely say I do either, but it does explain a lot. We still feel uncomfortable outside. We still feel like we're being watched. Every time we leave the house, we haven't seen anything or anything yet. I'll let you know, but for now, we're going to get more firepower, just in case. This happened not so long ago, but I haven't told anyone, simply for the fact that I didn't want to seem crazy. It was January 16th, somewhere around 9.45 when I left the house. The area I live in is small, and there's not a lot of places to hang out at. But my friend lives less than a mile away, so I decided to pay them a visit. I walked for half an hour until I came upon a ditch. I've been in this ditch multiple times during the day and night, so I didn't think anything of it when I saw it. I decided it'd be easier than following the main road, so I went inside the ditch. Worst decision of my life. About five minutes after I entered the ditch, I heard some twigs break, so I looked in the general direction I heard the sound in. I kid you not, I saw something run into the nearby bushes. It was skinny and gray. I freaked out and walked a little faster, but then I heard it following me. I decided to try and have a conversation with it. I talked for a bit about nonsense, about how the police would look for me if I went missing and how people knew where I was. 
which of course was a lie, but what else can you do in a situation like that? I talked for about 10 minutes and then broke off into a full-blown sprint. I could still feel its eyes on me the entire time, like it had kept up with me. I felt its glare until I came up to some houses and eventually got to my friends. I don't know if it was a skinwalker or some guy who could just run incredibly fast and keep up with my every move, but that was the scariest moment of my life. So, I quit my job as a park ranger a few days ago. Not because I got tired of it, it's because I've seen some crazy shit. I wasn't one of those park rangers that stand around or sit in a shack. I was the kind that were bound to towers, taking radio calls, and more. So it was a normal day just sitting, looking out for any strange things. You may be asking strange things. When I first got the job, they informed me of strange entities and happenings, those I still do not know to this day. As day started setting, I got a radio call from the other tower. Yes, I had the night shift that day. The man at the tower, or Chris, told me he's heading home, and just a reminder to look out because night isn't pretty. As I see his lights turn off at the tower, I knew that my shift started. Nothing really happens when you work the night shift, but this specific day was strange. I was sitting next to the park map they left us when I hear static coming from the radio. I knew someone was trying to contact the tower, so I walked over. Before I had time to respond, a scared, out-of-breath man was on the radio. Hello, I heard. I did the standard procedure. This is Tower 4. What seems to be the problem? Finally, someone help, the man said in relief. I, I was on the trail when I heard something behind me. Any more information, I asked him. Yeah, I, I started to speed up when I did it. It sounded like something was running after me. As soon as I heard it, I started running. Stay on the line, I said. I opened the instruction manual I was reading, the part about hikers being chased by an animal. As I was reading, I heard a scream over the radio. Hello, do you copy? I said. Help, whatever was chasing me is still chasing me. Keep running, but where are you? The lake. That's near Tower 2. Head to the nearest tower. We always leave the towers open, because when the shifts are over, they are required to unplug and put the radio in the locked box. Yeah, that's dumb, but it's how it works. As I return to the radio, I hear a scream from the radio and outside. It sounded like somebody was getting murdered. Hello, where are you? I hear on the radio. I lied for my safety. I'm at the tower I sent you to. Okay. He sounded so calm. I pulled out my binoculars and zoomed in on tower two. What I saw scares the shit out of me. It was a creature looking at me with red glowing eyes. It was waving at me. I was frozen in a state of paralysis, just being watched by this creature. It was weird. It almost looked like something out of a movie or a game. As I started to feel like I could move again, I used it to grab the hunting rifle given to me. I aimed but nothing was there anymore. I sat down and got the flask I hid in my drawer, and I took one sip. Then I heard the familiar creak of my tower steps. It was late, and no one comes to check up on me at this time. I hid under the bed provided. Who's there? The thing said. It sounded like my boss, but I knew it wasn't it. It sounded like a somewhat good impression. I knew it wasn't him when I saw its legs. It had hooves and fur, and I only saw its bottom part. It left. But whatever was there could replicate voices. Whatever it was, I don't know, but that was the one part that almost made me quit, but there are many more reasons. It was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure I and my dad found a dead juvenile dogman in our barn. It was in the wintertime, and we had two barns on our property, one which my father would use and another one on the far side of the property that was a little more out of shape. It desperately needed a new paint job and a lot of other things done to it. 
My father really never got around to it, so he just used it as storage and infrequently visited it. Our property was shaped more like a big rectangle. We had thick timber and fir all around our property line, except for the front which sloped down to a dirt road that rounded around our house, followed by more clear land. The barn that acted as a large storage shed was a few hundred yards away from the house, near the wood line, kind of tucked away in the corner of the property. The other barn, our shed, chicken coop, was all on the other side of the property. This left us with really no reason to go out that way, unless my dad needed some specific things from the other barn. Sorry, I have to lay out the details for you first. So, this was in the winter time, and I was helping my dad out in the storage barn, and he was clearing a bunch of old hay, because he was going to set one of his cars in there. It had been a brutally cold winter, lots of snow, and lots of ice. As we're clearing out the hay, we end up finding this thing. I don't know what you would call it. A dogman, I guess. It must have tried to find warmth in the old hay, and froze to death, I'm guessing. I'm not really sure how it died. That's just based on what I know now. As a kid, it really freaked me out. My dad just thought it was some strange animal, but it looked freaky. This thing looked to be the size of a child, but slightly larger than I. I was eight years old at the time, and it was very humanoid looking. It was curled up in the fetal position. It had black leathery skin and black matted fur all over its back. It had human-like hands with long black claws on the ends of each finger. The feet were dog-like, and the legs had hocks in them, just like a dog did. It had a wolf-looking face that looked like it was in anguish when it died. Its muzzle was the scariest thing about it at the time. It had long rows of razor-bladed teeth that kind of curled backward a little bit. They were sharp. Its eyes had already rotted out, and it was much frailer than I would have expected. If this thing truly matches with any of the living descriptions of a creature of similar features, I would imagine it to be quite muscular. It wasn't uncommon for us to find dead animals like that in our barn that would either eat poison or freeze from the winter, but I had no idea what we were looking at. I kept asking my father what it was, and he just kept telling me to bury it. It will always stick with me for as long as I can remember. I've been talking to my grandmother recently about Bigfoot. Weird creatures and things that just can't be explained. She's never shared this story with really anyone because no one she's known has shown interest in those subjects and she didn't want to feel crazy for telling her account. It took some convincing, but I got her to tell me the whole story of what happened to her on the farm she grew up on back in the 1940s. Before I tell you what her actual account is, I'll say that she is still a very coherent woman. No illness, no dementia, she is sharp as a tack still and is a very do-it-yourself, independent kind of woman. She's really getting up there in age and is still very mobile and healthy. She doesn't make up stories like this and simply has no reason to. On with what she told me. Back in 1940 and 1941, my grandmother and her father and family owned a small farm south of Springfield, Missouri. The family specialized in growing lots of vegetables, including but not limited to corn, tomatoes, onions, spinach, potatoes, beets, carrots, and more. World War II hadn't quite happened yet, and we're just reaching the tail end of the Depression, with the economy starting to pick back up again, from what she remembers. Things started to happen on her parents' farm. She remembers hearing these scary howling sounds way outside in the woods, and around the farm at night. She said the most frightening thing about all of it was how her father reacted to it. He was a tough man and had been through a lot and knew how to handle a gun. Whatever was making those noises really put fear into him. She says as the nights grew on, she would start hearing the howling noises coming closer and closer to the house. The family had a golden retriever that went missing shortly around this time. No trace of the dog. Livestock began disappearing too, and events occurred that required the police to get involved. In the coming weeks, Two of the hired ranchers disappeared without a trace. 
the police were being called in and determined both persons to be missing, and her parents were actually going to be charged with the murder and disappearance of these two individuals. It was later dropped when they were just determined them to be missing, and there was no foul play afoot. This all happened in a short span of time, when it got so bad, they were forced to move. Her father and family lost a great farm. She never really knew what it truly was until she was a little older. Her father would never tell her what it was that terrorized their farm, but my grandmother, even at an early age, knew it was something that really scared her just from what she had heard. My great-grandfather, my grandmother's father, passed away before I was ever born. Some time on his deathbed, he told her about why the farm was given away and sold. He told her he believed a hellhound had come to take away their farm. This is where it gets pretty intense. She says that her grandfather had made a pact with a very powerful and renowned witch in New Orleans. This individual practiced hoodoo, which is basically demonology and other various forms of black magic. Apparently, her grandfather made some sort of deal with him to pay this witch for power. Well, he ripped off the witch bad and took back most of his money somehow, so the witch casted demons to come after him as revenge and his family. Two years later, he went dead broke and ended up committing suicide. My grandmother's father was only just a boy when this happened and was primarily raised by his mother. He explained to her that he thinks the same demons were coming after him, the same ones that sent his father to financial ruin and suicide. They supposedly manifested as hellhounds, he called them. They stood on two legs, were very large, the size of a moose if it stood on two legs, he said, solid black with red glowing eyes. It looked more wicked and grotesque than a wolf. The way it looked at you told you it wanted to hurt you. It was straight from hell. My grandmother recounts her father getting very shaken up as he's explaining this to her. This terrified my grandmother because she had no idea even half of this was a reality at all. My great-grandfather passed away shortly thereafter. The weird thing is, my grandmother has had reoccurring nightmares with the same demon he told her about. Some nightmares that would be chasing her. Others it would get her and eat her alive. There were others, but she didn't really give me details. She said as she's gotten older, she's had them less and less, but they still happen from time to time. She's a Catholic, so I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it. So, we talked to our neighbors, and on that specific night, they were in our shop, working on a car. They said they had a machine running, so I didn't and would not have heard the noise. Today, they found one of their chickens buried in the snow. They assume it's a bobcat since they have killed four in the last month that we've been out there. Supposedly, though we have only seen one that they trapped and all that was left of the bait chicken was a claw on the side of the cage they trapped him in. The chicken they found in the coop had his head bitten off and guts torn out, but not eaten. Do bobcats normally just play with them, or would they take it and eat it? We don't know. But when this chicken was killed, we were assuming it was the night that we had heard the noise. I don't know anything about bobcats, so if you could let me know and explain to me, that would be great. So, an update. I just heard and that a great horned owl will do this to a chicken, which is something that we have heard out here, but not specifically seen. In fact, I was just outside on the phone, and who I was on the phone with could hear the ambulance on the trump pike going by. We were close enough to hear everything, but barely seen the turnpike, unless standing on a hill. As it was going by, our neighbor's dog was howling. The family of deer were chilling as usual. And then out of nowhere, it was like all throughout the woods surrounding us was this noise. At first, I wasn't panicking. It started off sounding like a bunch of geese or something taking off. Then, began to sound like people screaming for their lives. I started to panic. Even the deer were frozen with their heads up. It abruptly stopped and then started right back up, so I called my husband out to listen. And then it started to sound more clearly like yelps. 
War cries, maybe? But not from a few people, not even from 20 people, but hundreds of them, all throughout the woods, surrounding our house. I thought maybe coyotes, but I haven't heard that many like that. And I've read that even if it's just a few, they can make it to sound like it's a lot more. But it honestly didn't even sound like a coyote. Since being here, two bobcats have been caught, but even then it didn't sound anything like a bobcat. So really, I'm here to ask if it's even possible for one of those things we can't say or anything the nature of be out there, even though we really aren't even that close to any type of reservation. And if not, what could it have possibly been? It was so eerie that I'm still shaking, goosebumps, and it's echoing still in my head. I'm not one to get scared like this, but it was very bizarre. I have been a park ranger in a national park that's located in the United Kingdom, England, for just over 10 years. I'm not going to tell you which one, or even the county of which is located, for the sake of my job as I still work here, but there are some pretty weird things that you find every so often while on shift. Things that my superiors would likely not appreciate me sharing online. My job mainly involves patrolling the trails and checking that they're all in a safe state for people to walk through. I was also asked to talk with school children and assemblies and such after about a year or so on the job to express how important it is to stay with the group on the trails. I gave pretty obvious reasons for this, but little did I know, I would soon discover some of the horrifying truths as to why they should never wander off. The first story I'm going to share with you took place on a beautiful spring morning in June, I think. This was during my first year on the job. The sun was still low in the sky, but it was slowly rising and brightening my surroundings. I was on a normal morning patrol through one of the deeper trails as it hadn't been checked recently, and protocol to frequently check all the trails for fallen trees and any potential natural hazards to hikers. It was such a beautiful morning. I remember walking along with a slight smile on my face as I listened to nature, waking up in the trees and I found the cool breeze very relaxing and it had a truly peaceful effect on my mood. Suddenly, the trees to my left were filled with the sounds of birds squawking loudly as they frantically flew away. I stopped and listened for just a moment. Silence. A quote from another story I have read here reads, very true to this situation. Prey is silent when predators are near. Now understand that we don't have any bears or wolves here in England. Nothing like that. So I suppose it could be a deer that had snapped a twig. However, the noise wouldn't usually drop like that, as deer don't pose much of a threat to wildlife at all. I continued on, not thinking anything of it, and after a short time, I got the urge to check behind me. There was a man walking maybe 100 meters back, and I was on a long straight, so it was easy to tell. I was confused as the trails aren't usually used until a little later when early dog walkers would show up, and even then, few would wander this far into the woods at this time. He seemed to be walking at a very relaxed pace his hands in his dark blue hoodie's pockets, and he had faded blue jeans. I radioed over to ask if anyone had seen someone enter the trail. I was walking shortly after I left, but no one had seen anyone come in or out other than the occasional dog walker. I thought nothing of it, but continued on a slightly hurried pace. I usually wouldn't be bothered about it being out on my own with another stranger. I wasn't a small bloke nor someone to get spooked easily, however this guy just gave me a bad feeling. I was approaching a gate that leads to a much denser area of the woodland, more like a thick forest and as I closed the gate behind me, I noticed this man had stopped dead in his tracks. He seemed to be staring right at me, but I couldn't be sure. Then he broke into a sprint, not a light jog that somebody out for exercise might. I'm talking a full-on sprint. It was almost aggressive. I freaked out and turned to run. Why would a complete stranger, who was previously so calm and relaxed, suddenly be sprinting at me? He hadn't called for help or even waved to me. 
Fortunately, the trail's long straight section was over, and I ran around a curve and hid behind one of the many large rocks that were by the side of the trail. I could hear his heavy footsteps thudding towards me right until he was just on the other side of the rock, and he stopped. Again, dead in his tracks. He wasn't even out of breath. He just seemed to stand there for a while, and then just walked off. I waited for what must have been close to 10 minutes to be sure he was far ahead, and radioed the strange encounter to my colleagues, who agreed it was strange, and I cautiously continued on with my patrol. I never saw that strange man again, and I hope I never do. I have many more memories I would like to share with you. Stay safe out there. You are rarely truly alone in the forest. Ten years ago, I worked as a security guard to a rather popular apple orchard in the state of Massachusetts. I won't name the name of the orchard, but it is a very popular one. I ended up quitting my security job because of this incident. I had already been there for a few months when this happened, so I was doing my nightly routine. I was patrolling the west area of the orchard when I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I kept seeing this large shape dart between the trees in the orchard. I thought somebody was trying to sneak around, so I quickly investigated and shone my light into the orchard. I didn't see anything at first, but then I thought I saw a shape that didn't look like it was supposed to be there. I started walking closer, saying out loud, I'm coming to you. I know you're there. I take about another two to three steps, and this huge canine-like shape takes off bolting through the orchard. It was so loud, it sounded like ten gorillas crashing through the woods, destroying several of the apple trees in the process. It all happened so fast that I wasn't able to get a great look at it, other than I knew I wanted to be as far away from that thing as possible. I was telling my boss about it, and even he thought I was just making it up. It scared the hell out of me. I think mainly because it was so huge, just such a massive shape. Whatever it was had to have been easily 500 plus pounds, and looked like it was crouching down. As it took off, I did get a decent view of the back, and could see what looked like cropped ears on top of his head, and a little bit of a side profile on the muzzle. Hey, I have something very interesting that just happened to me the other day. I'm a stay-at-home dad, so I'm able to be home with my wife and kids during the day. I have an upstairs office in which I work from. I had come down to assist my wife with making lunch for us and the kids, and I was holding our baby daughter. Our daughter was getting quite fussy, so I thought I would take her outside since it was a beautiful day. You wouldn't believe it, but it's been the warmest it's ever been during the winter. We're starting to see buds on all the plants. In fact, I think spring is coming early. It's warm enough that I step out in shorts and a shirt. Maybe we're just acclimated to the weather, but it feels like a cool spring day. My daughter immediately calms down once we're outside, and she's looking around, enjoying the sun and fresh air. We're just standing there on the porch, soaking in all the air, when I'm like, come on, to my daughter, decide to walk off into my wraparound driveway towards my woodshed with her in my arms. As I do, I can see off to the field to my right. This field isn't visible from my porch since I have my car parked in the way and there's another shed blocking the vision. The scenery is breathtaking when you look out onto the field because in the background, you can see the mountains. As I'm looking out into the field, I see this big black animal slowly walking through the open woods. It was huge. It was walking funny too, and I had no idea what I was looking at. This was several hundred yards away, and I was barefoot, basketball shorts and a shirt, with my infant daughter in my arms. I wasn't going to try and run closer to get a better look, but in hindsight, maybe I should have. It wasn't going into the woods more, it was just walking along the wood line. I don't think it saw me. It never looked over in my direction. It had a huge hunch in its back, but reminded me physically of a large black wolf, at least from the outline. I thought it was strange since we don't have any animals out here that big, besides elk, deer, cow, you name it. 
I went back inside and told my wife about it, and even she's intrigued. Who knows what it could have been. This story is 100% true, and I'm writing it on here to warn other people and let them know that there's definitely something out there, and to this day, I still don't know what it was, nor have I ever gone into any woods or forest whatsoever. If you don't believe me, that's completely fine. Read this as a fun story at your own expense. But for those of you out there with an open mind, or you've seen something yourself, just know you are not alone. And just typing out and remembering this account is causing me to shake with anxiety and fear. First off, I'm a girl and live in North Carolina of the United States. I was 15 at the time of my encounter and was definitely not a believer in anything supernatural, paranormal, or anything of the sort. It happened while I was at a local summer camp. There was absolutely nothing special about that day. No weird lights, people, animals, sounds, nothing. It was just the same camp schedule as I'd grown used to in the past two weeks I'd been there. My age group had just finished lunch and was about to be able to persuade our counselor to let us play a game called Scatter Down by the Lake. It's like a giant hide and seek in the woods. Now, we had played this at least 20 times before that day, and nothing weird had happened to any of us, and we all grew up playing in the woods, so it's not like we had any aversion or fear of it. But for some reason that day, when our counselor shouted, SCATTER! and I ran to find a hiding place, it became a whole new ball game. I had run as far as I could while still being able to see the lake, as were the rules and had found a huge old uprooted tree that I decided would be the perfect hiding place. So, I laid down as close as I could against the ground and waited. I had been there for about five minutes when I suddenly heard a voice calling my name in a weird dreamy-like voice, and not just any voice, my mom's. Now, me and my mom are extremely close, thick as thieves, so I'd know her voice anywhere and I would swear on my own grave it was without a doubt hers. But I knew it couldn't be her. She was 20 miles away at work, and even if it had actually been her, she'd come to pick me up early. The voice wasn't coming from the lake. It was coming from further out in the woods, beyond the border of the camp. I knew I should have run away from this strange mimic mom voice, but I couldn't. It was almost hypnotic. It messed with my thoughts and gave me doubts, like, well, it could be mom, or what if she's hurt, and I have to get her now. All these things were flooding into my mind, like somebody had broken a dam and I didn't know it was there, until they finally overwhelmed me and emotions got the better of me, and I took off running in the direction the voice was coming from. I ran as far as I could with only this strange voice as my guide. I couldn't have run for more than five or seven minutes when I got to a clearing and the voice suddenly stopped. When I entered the clearing and didn't hear my mom's voice calling me anymore, I could finally think clearly again and started to have little alarm bells going off in my head saying, you idiot, that's not mom and you better run. But I couldn't run, I didn't know where to run. I had gotten so far away, I had lost sight of the lake by camp and had absolutely no idea where I was, and I was completely exhausted to boot. With no other options than to just sit there and catch my breath, I did just that. No sooner had I sat down, more warning bells went off in my mind. I quickly did a 360 survey around the clearing and noticed a strange noise. It wasn't the continuation of the voice before no, it was the distinct sound of chattering teeth like if you were cold, only there was no one else around, and it was the middle of June in North Carolina. There's no way someone would be cold. And that's when I heard it. Leaves and sticks crunching on the edge of the small clearing. And I realized something was watching me. And then whatever it was moved fast in circles around the clearing, almost like it was circling prey. And it was at that moment I knew whatever it was had led me out there away from the rest of my group, exactly like the predator instincts had been screaming at me that it was. 
Without any other option, I tried to escape. I took off in the direction I thought I came from and sprinted as fast as I could, all the while hearing the chittering of teeth and sticks crunching behind me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't dare turn around and see what was chasing me. I knew that if I did, I would slow down and I absolutely would not. It felt like a lifetime running away from this thing before I finally saw the lake. And even though I didn't think I could run any faster, I ran faster than I ever have in my life. When I broke the tree line and ran to the lake where I knew my friends were, at that point, I felt safe enough to stop and look back and see just what had been chasing me. But when I did, I only saw a fleeting form running back the way I had come and the distinct sound of chittering teeth. When I finally found my counselor, who was the seeker to find all of us, I was hysterical with fear and hugged her as tight as I could. When I finally calmed down, she tried to get me to tell her what happened, but I just asked, were you calling my name? Before she even said anything, I already knew the answer. After all, it had been my mom's voice that led me away from everyone else. But what she said, replied with, was so much more bone chilling to me. She told me, no one called for you. We didn't even know you were gone. Everyone is still hiding. The game isn't even over yet. I'm back with another story I'd like to share with you, or rather, I feel the need to share with you as there's nothing I like about it. When someone goes missing in our national parks, the British search and rescue team are contacted immediately. However, they are always at least half an hour's flight away, and even then they only have so much flight time before they are forced to turn their helicopter around to refuel. This leaves a lot of searching down to the rangers, as we know all of the areas and trails very well. It's always an adrenaline pumped situation to be in as you never know what the outcome will be. Usually, the helicopter spots the lost people within 20 minutes of joining the search, but then there are the missing people. You should know that between the rangers, we refer to these situations with two categories, lost people and missing people. A lost person is a normal search and rescue scenario. Somebody went down the wrong trail and hasn't been seen in a while, and perhaps thrown a broken leg for good measure. The main thing is that we find them, even if they are a little beaten up. A missing person is somebody who hasn't been seen for anything over a day, or if the situation just seems off. For example, when people just seem to disappear, I have one particular case I'm going to share with you. I will warn you closer to the time, but there is some pretty explicit content in this memory, so here is your far pre-warning. It was a pretty standard shift. The sky was just starting to dim as the sun started sinking towards the horizon, and I was sat in the ranger station, taking calls and checking emails, when a woman comes bursting through the door absolutely beside herself. Her hair is a mess with leaves tangled in it. Her makeup is all smudged down and across her face and her eyes are red from crying. She's telling me that her son had been by her side one minute and when he went into the bushes just off the trail for a wee, he never came back. There was no scream, no noise, no nothing. I knew at this instant we had a missing person on our hands and my heart stopped. A missing child was always bad news and seldom had a happy ending. He had been in the bush for maybe two minutes when his mother called out to him and she went running into the woods to try and find him. She was very lucky to have made it back to the trail without getting lost or worse if you ask me. I tried my best to calm her down and took her to a map and after showing her where our station was, I asked her to try and locate their average location at the time while I made some calls. She protested at first, but after assuring her we had dealt with this kind of situation many times before, she brought herself to trust my instructions and started tracing her tracks on the map. I immediately called the search and rescue team closest to us and told them the exact location was to be confirmed, but 
to dispatch a helicopter for a missing child. They give us an ETA of 40 minutes. I gather all the rangers on duty, and after confirming with the woman where she believed they were when he disappeared, we all get assigned grids on the map to check and we head out. We are very thorough as we search, and we each square off the grid very effectively and do not leave so much as a rock unturned. So we're getting deeper and deeper into the woods at this point. We'd been searching for a good couple of hours, but the dogs hadn't picked up the boy's scent yet, and we were merely doing a routine comb-styled search. The helicopter was buzzing around, non-stop, and everybody was quiet. No one really spoke much while looking for children. I think it's because of the fact that it's a child we are looking for, not an adult who may be able to look after themselves. I'm getting this heavy, knotted feeling in my gut. You know, the kind you get when you just know that it's going to be a fruitless effort. I should also mention that it's getting dark now, and there's not much light left, and what little is left is completely blocked out by the trees, so it's flashlights from here on out. We'll never find this kid, bro, my colleague said in a completely flat voice. Don't talk like that. We never know what we can find while searching. I reply sharply, though deep down in my gut, I knew that child was gone. The helicopter heads back for some more fuel and comes back again. After a further few hours of searching, it is getting very dark and we call it a night as everyone needs to be back before the forest was completely consumed by darkness. The woman stayed in one of the medical beds we had previously prepared for her son, though I doubt she slept at all. I watched the cameras that lay deep in the forest, someone in the area the child could have walked in. After an hour or so of nothing, I eventually decide to call it a night. We didn't find this boy the next day, or the day after that, for the matter. Three weeks later, one of our rangers radios that they found the body of the child deep into the woods and that we need to get there and fast. She sounded worried. A few rangers and I jump into a 4x4 that we used to get deep into the woods quickly and we make our way to the location described. It's a clearing near an old entrance to a closed off cave. The trees seem to all lean over towards the cave entrance as if to be watching intently for whatever is next to climb out. We arrived after a 10 or maybe 15 minute ride. It was one of the most uncomfortable and tense rides of my career as the vehicle access trail was rarely used as we didn't have much reason to come this far out into the woods, and we've never traveled at this speed. We parked in the clearing and approached what would turn out to be one of the most disturbing experiences of my career. I would like to take this opportunity to warn you that what I describe next could be disturbing to some and cause upset as I can only label it as child abuse. The boy was curled in the fetal position, laid on his left side, and it may have looked as if he died naturally if it wasn't for the huge pool of blood he was laying in, along with the fact that he was completely naked. We rolled his stiff body over onto his back, and I think we all took a step back, as if some force had pushed us all away at the same time. Some sick fuck had sliced his gut open, allowing all of his innards to spill out. But the horror didn't end there. Oh god no. Please understand that this is not an easy memory for me to recite, so forgive me for not going into too much detail, though I doubt I will feel like they missed out. The left everything of this boy was gone. His left eye, his left ear, left testicle, left hand, foot, etc. I was mortified, and I'm not ashamed to say that I threw up violently almost instantly upon taking all of this in for a moment. Every cut was very neat and clean, more so than you'd imagine a surgeon can make, especially out in the woods. What was even more horrifying was that the body couldn't have been more than a few days old. Whoever, or whatever for that matter, had taken him, had done this, had kept him hostage for almost three weeks. The thought of how terrified this child must have been still sickens me, even now, nearly seven years on. We called it in an air ambulance and took his body away to be examined by the police and checked for prints. 
Now, we're not really meant to be kept in the loop on following up on investigations after they've left the park. However, the local police officers would tend to update us regularly on the results of these findings. An officer had rung up to update us, and his voice sounded dull. He sounded almost as if he was very depressed to be making the call, and I can understand why. The post-mortal had revealed that the cuts all seemed to be taken from when the boy was alive. Furthermore, it seemed that there was no traces of food in the boy's stomach, so he clearly wasn't fed either. Apparently, there were more body parts missing, but I just thanked the officer for informing me and hung up the phone, slowly. I sat there for a good 20 minutes, bawling my eyes out, before relaying this horrific update to my colleagues. How that little boy didn't die sooner is beyond me. I can't contemplate how this could happen, but whoever or whatever did this is definitely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. That trail was closed off for a good time, and there were armed patrols through that area of the woods for nearly four months, following in a desperate attempt to find a trace of who did this, or at least where it happened. We found nothing. Not even the other body parts. They even explored that of the cave that was still quote-unquote safe access, despite it being closed off due to many deaths due to a lack of safety. This is not the only experience of this nature that occurred. However, I'm going to cut it off here. I'm done writing for today as I get emotional, so just allowing the memory to crop back to me. Please, keep your children close by your side, and if they need the toilet, they must either wait or you must accompany them and never stray far from the trail. No more than five meters would be my recommendation. Not unless you know exactly what you're doing. I work for a county cleanup crew in Mississippi. I won't say which county because my name is known around here and I don't want to receive any flack for telling you guys this. I do many different things for the county, but I've gone on the cleanup crew a few times. Let me explain to you what I mean by the cleanup crew. I'll go through some of the more rural highways and areas with a lot of critter traffic and cleanup roadkill. Whole lot more to say than that. One day, I was doing my route by myself. It was a long highway that really goes out there in the country. This area is notorious for roadkill, such as squirrels and skunks. Deer a lot of times too, but not as much. We get a lot of other critters like possums and raccoons, but they're all amongst the bunch. In my time doing this, I've come across several carcasses of deer that are torn to pieces. I don't mean just ripped open and eaten. I'm talking literally ripped open and guts torn out and thrown everywhere. It's a mess. The only meat that is being eaten is by the flies and maggots. What I think happens is that some of these deer get hit by trucks and get knocked onto the side of the road, and then perhaps some large bear or other predator comes and does this to the deer. Only problem is what kind of predator doesn't eat the meat, but instead rips up the carcass. Well, I would find that out in just a few months. I was driving home and it was in the evening time, so it was already dark. I actually lived not too far away from some of the highways I'm assigned to clean up. Upon coming up a rather large hill, was a dead deer in the other lane of the road, as well as this monstrous wolf-looking person or thing, and it was crouched down, just like a person would. It was ripping the meat off the bone. I came upon the hill, saw the scene in front of me, but didn't slow down or speed up. I just kept driving, and I took it in all at once. Whatever this animal was never looked up at me or cared to notice me, but in the three seconds I saw everything that I did, it was ripping the skin off the carcass and had what appeared to be blood all over its hands and chest. I didn't really see the face, but it looked very coyote-like. It was gray-looking and slender. It wasn't huge, but it looked to be about as big as me and you. I have never quite heard of an animal like this, but I dismissed it and kept driving. It wasn't until later on that I pieced it together once I found another deer carcass that looks like the same thing and wondered if it was from this animal. I had begun asking around my area if anybody had seen a creature like the one I saw, and, of course, I was either laughed at or told I was crazy. That's when I knew I was onto something. 
Whatever I saw didn't scare me, but it did intrigue me because I didn't know those kinds of things can exist. It certainly seems like it would possess incredible killing power. I was curious. I really wanted to do some heavy research and dig up what I could. Unfortunately, not a lot turned up, but then I stumbled upon the keyword Dogman and started reading encounter after encounter and stories. I've heard everything from the bodybuilder, pitch black looking dogman, to the more hyena looking dogman, to even the coyote skinny kind of dogman. The whole phenomenon is really interesting and I'm not sure if these creatures are regional or what the deal is, but now it does make sense and I do believe I saw one of these things. I'm here to basically act as a whistleblower on the wildlife management of Florida and Georgia State. I spent a lot of my free time in the national state parks, wildlife areas, and state forests. I hike for miles and miles, and I've come across over six dead black bears now. I've traveled through the John Bathia State Forest, up into Georgia, into the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge down into the Apalachicola National Forest, and of course, Tate's Hell State Forest. It's well known there is a thriving population of black bear here in the south, especially in Florida State, and there is nothing to my knowledge of the animal kingdom that kills them. Over the last year, in fact not even 12 months in my adventures, I've come across six carcasses of mangled, attacked, and bloody, beaten black bear. First time or two, I wasn't sure what to make of it. Now I'm certain something is killing these bears. I want to state that these bear carcasses I found were not small black bear either. These are full-grown adult males I'm talking about. I'm talking a good 400 to 450 pounds of black bear. I don't think we have wolves down here, so I can't say that's what it is, but these bears look like they've been attacked by a meat grinder. Chunks of their skin and flesh are missing, and they're soaked in blood and mangled up pretty badly. You'll never find these bodies on trails, only far off in the middle of nowhere like I have. When I go and adventure into these places, I go miles in, staying far away from trails to keep solitude. The bears that I find are generally by creeks, pastures, or other areas out in the open that would suggest they were attacked by something while vulnerable. The most alarming and bothersome thing I found was closer to Tate's Hell State Forest in northern Florida. I stumbled upon an area that looked to be a black bear den. It was a tiny cave that lowered into the ground with brush all around it. You can't see the front from the top, but once you come around, you can actually see that it leads down into this small, cavernous space. The smell is what got me first. I smelt death, came through the thicket and saw blood. Climbing around and down allowed me to see what it was. This is just what I saw and what looked like happened. Something, I don't know what, pulled this black bear out of its den and ripped it in half. Its top half of its stomach was missing. Pieces of muscle, blood, tissue and guts were pulled all over the place and partially decayed. There had already been maggots, so it could have happened a day or two prior. Remember, conditions down here for decay are highly more rapid than of the north with the heat, humidity, and all. I've never in my life seen a black bear ripped in half from the waist up. Part of its tattered spine and ribcage were partially exposed through the rotting bloody tissue and skin. I'll never forget such a horrid image. Looking down in the dirt, it looked like there was mass signs of what I would call struggle and chaos. Something went on. Looking around the bear, you can tell this thing struggled for its life and fought. Plants and dirt all around it were disturbed and ripped up. What rips the top half of a bear off and eats it? Looking around further, I found no signs of any more blood other than what was surrounding the dead half of the bear. There were no bones, nor any blood trails that would indicate a predator tore the bear in half and walked off with the other. I was flabbergasted and deeply concerned at what kind of animal 
or predator is out here doing this to bears. You don't have to believe me, but I'm telling you what I've seen and experienced. I'm blowing the whistle because people need to know about this. People need to know something is going on, and I believe the wildlife management know very well what's going on. I'm sure there are far more bodies, and I'm sure it's worse than we know. I doubt I'm the only one who has seen these dead black bear. Last night, I posted about seeing something strange. Today, after I got home from school, I investigated the area. The brush is actually taller than 7 feet due to a shallow dip in the ground. What got my attention is that there is a small game trail for rabbits or maybe a coyote. I know the horses aren't to blame because I couldn't fit there. There was quite a bit of small bushes that were flattened by something. There was not any other damage around it, and whatever was there would have had to disturb the brush growing above the flattened bushes. It's all tangled briars at the top. Whatever was there had to have been either behind said brush or somehow hovering over the brush. There's an old oak stump with new tree growth on it, but it doesn't reach that far over. Back in the late 90s, my roommate and I dabbled in black magic and summoning demons to do our bidding. Well, I should say my interest into the whole thing was very short-lived. In fact, I actually never made it that far, other than doing maybe one Ouija board session. My roommate, however, grew obsessive about it and got really involved in spells and furthering his skills, we'll call it. He always showed an interest in the dark arts before we dabbled in it, and he got serious about it. It got too much for me to deal with, and I ended up moving on afterwards, but I'll explain how it all started. So, my roommate and I had been friends for a while before we moved in together. We were both male in our mid-twenties with stable jobs while going to school full-time. We had been friends since the beginning of college, not super close, but enough that with the given circumstances, we figured we'd be roomies and split the rent on a nice two-bedroom, one-bath house. Originally, he was renting it and had a different roommate. The roommate moved out, and it just so happened I was looking for a place at the time, and it worked. This would have been in June, I think because I just finished my spring trimester in my college. It was hot out too. Living there was not bad for the time being and till around September October he kept bringing up the idea of spells and Ouija boards and controlling spirits. At first I thought he was just messing around but I realized he wasn't after he kept bringing it up. Then I thought he was crazy wanting to mess with that stuff. He brought home a Ouija board one day and convinced me to try it with him. On our first try, it actually worked. He led the session and apparently, we came in contact with the original owners of the house from well over a hundred years ago. It was a very old house. We ended the session and didn't really touch the Ouija board for another couple days until I came home from class one night. He was in the living room, doing it himself and talking to a spirit guide is what he told me. He was asking the spirit guide about spells and how to control other entities. It really started to freak me out. I can't remember if it gave him direct answers because I didn't stay in the room. The following week, he bought a few different spell books and black magic ritual tutorials. He started casting spells in his room and other dark rituals. His personality started to change around this time and became much more reclusive. It went from him hanging out in the living room and visiting with me all the time to rarely ever seeing him. He would keep all the lights off in the house and stay locked away in his room. When I would get home and turn the lights on, I would hear him screaming at me from his room to turn them off. Of course, I screamed back and told him we need lights on. Anyway, when I would see him, he looked like he hadn't slept in days and began to look more frail and pale by the day. His behavior was really beginning to scare me. I don't remember the exact day, but I came home from class one day and he was telling me we were going to have some nightly visitors and that he had mastered a spell to summon 
night children, he referred to them as. Keep in mind, we're in a smaller house in a suburb, not too far away from college, so I don't know what he meant by this. I actually forgot all about it later on and fell asleep studying for a test. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to a tapping on my window. I was startled awake and shot up because of the noise. I didn't have any curtains on my windows, so I could clearly see if anybody was outside my window. I turned my head and looking at me outside my window was the scariest looking hyena thing I've ever seen. Its paw or hand, whatever it was, pressed up against the glass and this thing was grinning at me with glowing red eyes. It was dark, so I couldn't make out a lot of details of its fur, but it was terrifying looking. I didn't immediately think of any correlation between what I was seeing and my roommate. I quickly ran out of my room and hid in the bathroom where I fell asleep on the toilet, waiting for this thing to disappear. I must have stayed asleep in there for a while, because I woke up and it was around 6 in the morning and it was about time for me to get ready for school soon. My roommate wasn't home in the morning, and so I didn't see him again until that evening when I got home. He was sitting in the living room in the pitch black darkness. It was very strange, and he was really starting to disturb me. After I come in and turn on the light, I asked him why he was sitting in the dark. He ignored my question, and without making eye contact, said to me, So, I heard you had a little run-in with one of my children. At first, I had no idea what the hell he was talking about, and then it clicked in my head. He then tells me that more will be coming, and he is controlling them to do harm to other students who have wronged him. At this point, I knew he was dangerous, but I didn't realize he was this crazy. I told him whatever, and we didn't speak for the remainder of the evening. Nothing happened that night, but as the nights continued on, I began feeling these things' presence come around. I was up late one of these nights and my skin started to crawl and my hair stood up. I just knew in my gut these things were outside of our house and I didn't dare look out my window. Not even five minutes later, I hear my roommate outside talking. I don't know if he was talking to one of these things or what, but I couldn't make out what he was saying, just could hear his voice. This became a nightly occurrence. After a few more days of this happening, I stayed home from my morning class and he came home from being out all night, doing God knows what. I approached him and told him he needs to knock this black magic stuff off and these creatures he's bringing around our house and it needs to stop. He just laughed at me and went to his room and locked the door. I let him know the very next day I was going to be moving out and he was on his own. This freaky shit has gotten way too out of hand and it was too much for me. He never said a word during any of this. I moved out and I guess he continued to stay there. In fact, I think he even got a new roommate on board, but I had no idea what that situation looked like. I kept my distance and stayed away from him, after all, and anyone he was friends with. I had friends saying that they were seeing freaky shit on campus though, especially at nighttime, and some friends claiming that they saw werewolves. I never said anything about what I saw because I don't know what it is I saw. I don't know if it was a demon or what the hell it was, but it scared me. After I finished college, I never came back in contact with him. Fast forward to 2006, and an old friend from college had heard through the grapevine that my old black magic roommate committed suicide back in 2004. So, I had something pretty weird happen a little over an hour ago. I was standing out by my truck, smoking a cigarette. We have about seven acres with a small forest in the back portion. My parking spot is beside our metal garage and you can see the front portion of our land from here as well, as the far corner where the woods are. Well, I was shining my flashlight through the brush. I live in West Georgia. Coyotes have been attacking our dogs and terrorizing our horses. I saw some weird pair of eyes staring at me from a patch of tall grass. I am six foot three, and the grass there goes up to my ears, so this thing had to have been at least eight feet tall. 
The eyes were like a blue flame on a torch. I made eye contact with it, and I thought I saw a smaller second pair behind it. I don't usually go outside much after dark, solely because of the threat of coyotes, and whenever we hear something at night, we grab a loaded AR, and I usually walk around and check things out. I had done that earlier today and didn't find anything, but as soon as I come out without the rifle, I see these pair of eyes. What's a way I can protect myself? I don't think a 556 is going to phase a goddamn skinwalker. Before I tell you the story, I would like to give you a little background information on me and the situation. I'm 39, and I have a wife, Taylor, who is 32. We have been married for almost 10 years now, and I have grown extremely close with her family. Particularly, her grandmother, Verla, who just passed away last year. Her grandmother was a very interesting character, had a very successful business and plentiful amounts of wealth. She was quite the businesswoman from what I heard from her colleagues. Anyway, she owned a very large house that was plantation styled in northern Kentucky. This huge plot of land featured acres and acres, as well as a barn and other stuff on the property. I mean, this is a huge house we're talking about. Maybe close to a mansion size? I don't know. We've known about it, but we've never actually been out there ourselves till this last year to see the house. We live in Northern California, and she would always come and visit us, so we never really had a reason to go out there. She was very close with my wife, and I as well. And, of course, from her passing, it was extremely difficult for both of us. She did leave a will, and it turns out that she actually left the house and her property to my wife in the will. We were astonished that she would do this, but she did leave huge sums of money for some of my wife's brothers and sisters. We flew out to Kentucky to check the place out since it was now in my wife's name. I know she was really wishy-washy about it, but I'm not sure she wanted to really go through with it. I thought about selling it, but she also thought about keeping it and us moving into it. It all depended on what the property looked like and how much work was going to be needed. Knowing Verla, she had the place pretty spot on and kept up on things really great. She didn't have any grandkids or anything like that, so the house stayed pretty immaculate. She was always kind of a clean freak though, even when she would come over. So, we get to northern Kentucky, and we go to check out this house. She lived pretty secluded. You had to take this long two-lane road, and then onto this long dirt gravel road that would eventually lead you to her property. Her property itself was beautiful, with what I can only describe as big rolling pastures that went on and on with the Kentucky wilderness all around. It was utterly breathtaking. She even had an older well on the property. The house itself was massive and had five or so bedrooms and three bathrooms, and a couple of additional bedrooms used for stuff, I guess. An attic and a basement were also included and other various rooms that weren't being used or used to store only items. Again, there was a lot of rooms. It was a beautiful older home and had a nice big wood stove in the kitchen that was used primarily for heating and cooking. I had big ideas in my head already to flip this thing and make a killing since I had no desire to want to live in it. From we could tell right away that the house was in fairly good shape. My wife was very impressed with the house but came to the same conclusion that maybe we should try and sell it versus abandoning our jobs back at home. We sat outside on the massive wraparound porch, talking about our plans and what we wanted to do. This was in the evening time, and at some point during our conversation, we began to hear strange vocalizations off in the woods next to us. My wife and I would exchange glances every time we heard these. They began to get more and more disturbing and strange, I'm no wildlife expert, but I'm pretty sure I've never heard an animal noise quite like this. It was like a guttural howl. It sounded so low, and whatever made the sound had to have quite the set of lungs. Then, we would hear this really low growling sound. It was all around the woods around us. It made us uncomfortable, but it wasn't too out of control. 
The noise had stopped after a while, and we quickly forgot about it. We decided to do one more walk around the house, just to get a better feel for things on the outside. It was really starting to get dusk, so we weren't planning on staying too much longer. My wife began to notice weird things around the sides of the house. Huge tracks going back and forth around the house. Canine tracks, specifically. Big ones. As she began to notice more and more, there was a bunch of them. This was weird because Verla was not an animal person at all, and in fact she was actually allergic to most pets, including cats and dogs. She lived pretty remotely, so we thought it was strange. There were also no neighbors within miles of her, so there's no reason any dogs at all should have been around her property, but there were multiple tracks and multiple sets of these prints. That's when my wife discovered that several of the basement windows had been broken all around the house. Where the windows were broken, there were a lot of these big canine tracks walking off into this spot. We both looked at each other. Is some big dog breaking into my wife's dead grandmother's house? I don't remember if I said it, but it was dusk at this point and so it was starting to get darker and darker. I don't know if it was the sheer abnormality of the situation that caused our skin to crawl, but I could have sworn in that moment things around us got quiet. I began to feel really on edge and I could tell my wife began to feel uncomfortable as well. I told her we'll just come back in the morning and look a little further. Up to this point we had only done a quick walkthrough of the house. We didn't thoroughly search or anything. This will make sense in a second. So. We'd go back that night and would come back the following morning. Things seemed fairly normal. There's no noise from the woods and all seems alive and well. Well, no weird noises, but we heard nature, of course. We looked on through the house and decided to search a little more thoroughly. If we were going to sell this thing, we wanted to make sure there wasn't anything out of place or anything cosmetically that we needed to fix. From the previous day and the broken windows in the basement, could prove to be a problem, so we wanted to get down there and see what we could do to fix them. The great thing is that if we were to sell this place, we can really make a lot of money because it was such a beautiful piece of land. Thank you Lord that Verla did such an amazing job at keeping up on her house. We headed on down to the kitchen and into the basement, into a very massive basement mind you. As soon as we opened the door, we're hit in the face with this stench of wet dog and urine. It's so thick it almost knocked us back on our feet. I remember my wife saying, Oh God, as she's covering her face with her arm and walking down the stairs. Because it was an older house, the light to the basement was at the very bottom, so she just used her phone light to navigate down the stairs. I had followed closely behind her. Once we got to the bottom and turned the light on, we could see that the basement actually had a lot of room. There's the main basement room that we were in, and off to our left was a small room that looks like it could have been a wine cellar at some point. It had no windows in there. Off to our right was another small little hallway area that had a washer and dryer, and beyond that another room. The window in the room we were currently in was smashed inward, like something broken in. We didn't see any traces of hair or anything that would lead to somebody breaking in, but the stench of wet dog and urine was really bad. My wife and I chalked it up to some animal, probably a dog breaking in here and sleeping down here, even though it didn't add up at all with the tracks outside. It felt odd to even think about that because dogs don't act like that, nor do they behave in such a bizarre manner. The other weird thing was the basement windows were larger, but they were still about a 7 foot drop from the window to the ground. So how is the dog, if that's what it was, getting in and out of the basement? To our knowledge, nobody had been over at this house since she had died, which was about 5 weeks prior. This had to have been recent. We searched the other room with the window to see if there was anything we could find and it was just more broken glass and that horrible, horrible stench. It gets even more weird though. After leaving the basement and spending more time looking throughout the house, I noticed that there was salt along every doorway upstairs and sage in every bedroom. I didn't really notice this before because I didn't take the time to pay attention, 
but it immediately struck me as weird. I'm no expert, but aren't lining doorways with salt and burning sage a way to ward off evil spirits? From what we knew, Verla was a hardcore atheist and thought everything of the spiritual manner was childish and make-believe. Why would she have this in her house? Plus the tracks outside the house and the weird noises during the day before the woods getting quiet. It was just too weird, and so we decided to call it a day and maybe get a realtor involved in helping us sell the place. I remember when we left, or I should say as we were leaving the house, I remember feeling very uncomfortable. On the drive back to the hotel, I was asking my wife if Mamie Verla knew if there was the possibility of a poltergeist being in the house. But that doesn't explain the basement windows being busted inwards, like something had broken in and was living down there. Maybe they were two separate problems. I don't know, but it was weird. She agreed that the house kind of gave her weird vibes too, and not the good kind. The following day, we called up a local realtor and explained our situation, and she happily agreed to help us sell the house. We wanted her to go check out the place and get her opinion, so we scheduled the following day for her to come out with us and check the house out. We were supposed to be at the house that morning by 11 a.m., and we ended up getting stuck in traffic by about 20 minutes or so. So we're on our way there, I think it was around 11.15, and we get a phone call from the realtor. She sounded panicked and said we're going to have to find somebody else to help sell the house. She told us and asked us if we're aware that a big black dog was running around outside the house and ran after her to attack her. It scared her so bad. My wife and I were both thoroughly confused at what she was saying, but she was frantic and ended the call. Luckily, my wife's sister's husband was an investor and dealt with rental properties more than anything else. We got in touch with him and asked if he would be interested in helping us sell the house and splitting the profit since my wife owned it now. He happily agreed and flew out to meet us. We had lunch, talked about the house and how much we were planning on selling it for. He offered to go check out the place and give us a good appraisal on the property. We trusted his judgment well since he knew the real estate game pretty thoroughly. We also informed them that a realtor that we just tried to work with was spooked off the property by some dog or so, so we warned him of that. He chuckled and went on his way. Well, we get a phone call from him about three hours after lunch, and the only thing he told us was that he's not helping us sell the house, that we're on our own. My wife and I are furious at this point and demand answers, but he refused to answer any questions and just said he's never going anywhere near that house again and that we need to stay away from it too. Exhausted, frustrated, and confused, we had no idea what the hell to do. The whole house selling process was very confusing and we were very new to it. We needed help, but everybody seemed to keep giving up on us, so my wife just decided to hold on to the house for a little bit longer and determine later on how we're going to sell the damn thing. My wife still is holding on to that property, and we've gone back a couple of times with some crazy things happening to us. Although, because there's so many things that happened, I'm not going to write it all out in one email, so... I may send you more of that later, but for now, this is the gist of our situation with this house. We can't get rid of it, and there's some sort of crazy things going on with that property. For the past few nights, a skinwalker has been outside of my house. Last night, it started tapping on random windows. Tonight, I was outside and the crickets went silent. My mother and I are generally very spiritual, and so on. Long story short, we know when something evil is nearby. We're in Glendale, Arizona, in case any of you are worried about the location. To give you my first update, my cat was full on leaning and scratching at the window, trying to get at something. She's very shy and reserved, so this was weird. Second update. My mom woke up early around the time when it was still dark and went outside to smoke a cigarette. She heard whistling and our new dog was whining and trying to get my mom inside. She was happy to go in. Only the dead whistle at night. Update 3. Someone knocked on the door in broad daylight. 
I looked outside, but nobody was there. No packages, no bugs, nothing. The knocking sounded urgent and loud. The fourth and final update. My mother still hears whistling every time she goes outside when it's dark, coming from the direction of a building behind our house. I can feel them getting closer each day. My daughter attends the University of Western Florida, and I had just finished getting her settled in her dorm room, stocked up on groceries and other essentials. I left in the late morning to head back home, which is east of Pensacola, some three plus hours. All through the first hour or so, there were tremendous rain bands like we are used to here in Florida. As I was traveling on Interstate 10, the trailer trucks would put a literal fog of water spray so I wasn't going more than 50 miles an hour. As I got out of the last rain band, the sky got brighter and brighter to the point where I could get back up to 70 miles an hour. I was still following a car, about 10 car lengths. I checked the rear view and no traffic behind and I remember looking around the car ahead and nothing for some distance. I was just about ready to pass the white car when he put his brakes and I closed distance to him fairly quickly. I braked also, not knowing what was ahead of him. Maybe a truck tire carcass and he could swerve into my lane and I pass him. Even though I am driving a pickup truck, I ride a motorcycle and sort of drive like I ride, very defensively. As I slowed, I noticed some movement off the road. We were both in the right lane. On the other side of the guardrail, something caught my eye. We had just come over either a swampy area or a small creek, so there was a guardrail over that area. Still, there was a gully between the guardrail and the tree line, maybe 20 feet deep. Almost instantly, I thought bear, but wrong color. Our bear here are jet black, and if they stand and you have the rare chance to see that, they aren't very tall. The next thought I had was a man in a ghillie suit, but wrong again. This was not material, it was hair, matted down wet hair, and the height maybe eight feet. It was huge. So as I saw it, by this time I was almost stopped. The car ahead directly a beam of the creature and stopped or very slow. What I saw was a living creature. Everything articulated perfectly. Head, arms, and legs. I had a profile to a back view of it. Saw its muscles in the upper back. The color wasn't exactly uniform, but varied between shades of chocolate brown. The head looked rounded. I couldn't see ears or a neck, but it definitely had a head and looked down before stepping into the goalie. At that time, I saw arms that moved, but really saw the separate legs and saw what was matted hair stuck together from the leg. It stepped down, rounded the goalie, and out the other side to go into the tree line. Its motion was very smooth, almost like it was gliding, so, even if a man could don a suit and act like an eight-foot-tall living creature, how would he manage to walk down a steep embankment that was grassy and wet? Any human would be on his ass or tumble dangerously down that embankment. Anyway, I hurriedly called the wife, who laughed at me for a minute or two, but then realized I was serious. She said, get the license plate of the car, which I didn't, and where are you? I was surprised that I hadn't done all of that. Frankly, I think I was dazed. Well, I know there is someone else that saw this thing, but that is about all. I would estimate this thing weighed about four to 500 pounds. It wasn't fat or barrel chested. It wasn't skinny either, like it didn't have enough to eat. It was healthy and athletic in appearance, and it sure covered a difficult area in no time. By the way, this interstate highway cuts through the England I am an avid upland bird hunter who lives in Oregon. I have a flushing dog I train to hunt. An English setter, Reggie, who I take out most weekends of the hunting season to look for pheasant, quail, grouse, partridge, or ducks. For the last three years, the only meat I've eaten from mid-September through the end of January 
has been the birds my dog and I hunt, plus the elk or deer that I usually bag in during archery season. It's something I've become pretty passionate about. Two weekends ago was the end of quail, grouse, and partridge season, so I planned a day trip out to eastern Oregon. For those who don't know, most of Oregon is essentially a desert. The area between the Cascade Mountains and the Pacific is rainy and forested, and what most people think of when they picture Oregon. However, with the exception of a few small mountain ranges, two-thirds of the state east of the Cascades is just sagebrush, red rocks, and arid country for hundreds of miles to the Idaho border. While quite cold this time of year, it's still amazingly beautiful with literally millions of acres of public land where there's great bird hunting. I loaded Reggie and my gear in the truck early Saturday morning, several hours before sunrise, and set off. Just at first light, we got to a big open river valley I've spent lots of time exploring, but this specific area was new to me. It was about 30 degrees, looked like a light dusting of snow the night before, but otherwise pretty dry and would be a fairly clear day. I love these moments, maybe more than anything in life. Being the only human in a massive wild landscape without a single trail or building for miles. The isolation, the giddiness for the upcoming adventure, the feeling of exploring an area that looked the same 500 years ago, the feeling of going out to get my own food, the contrast between hot coffee in my thermos and cold winter wind on my exposed hands. All of it. Just my favorite place to be. I got the dog ready, put on my boots and pack, loaded the shotgun, and we set off along the top of the valley ridge, 600 to 700 yards above the river, looking out over the arid, cold landscape, hued by the silvery blue wolf light of early winter mornings. For those who've never seen it, watching a hunting dog work is a truly fascinating spectacle to behold. It's honestly why I enjoy upland bird hunting so much. To me, watching a really good hunting dog actively hunt for wild game birds is honestly not that much different from watching a trained dolphin or sea lion at SeaWorld or something like that. A work dog doing its job can be so focused and intelligent, it's shocking sometimes. I trained Reggie well, but so much of it is primal and innate. It's Reggie's sixth hunting season, so we've spent hundreds of days off trail exploring the backcountry, and we've really learned to read each other well. Coastal rainforests, high desert, alpine mountains, hardwood forests, farmland, swamps, marshes. We've adventured through it all together. If there's a game bird near, Reggie sells it. I can tell from how his tail moves, the frequency of sniffing, and the lateral angles of his turns. I can tell if he smells another person from how he looks back at me. I can tell if he smells a coyote, wolf, bear, or mountain lion from how he drops his spine. I can tell if he smells an elk, deer, or moose from how he tilts his head to catch the wind. He's my best friend. We're a real solid team. About an hour after we started hiking along the valley ridge, we came to a gully that cut downhill through the ridge toward the river, which we'd have to cross. I picked a route down the steep rise to the dry, boulder-filled creek bed at the bottom of the gully, where a deer trail led back up the other side. Halfway down the slope, Reggie started acting real strange. He stopped about 30 feet in front of me, cocked his head to the side, and fixed his gaze down to our left, toward a spot in the dry creek bed as it dropped down the valley. He then leaned his head forward, as if trying to get a better view, and then started turning around toward me without pulling his eyes off the spot, which he really only does when he's scared of something, like when we go to the vet or I start up a chainsaw. Then he bolted up the steep side of the gully to where I was standing. What is it, bud? He kept switching his gaze from my eyes to the same spot below us while pacing around in half circles. Strange. My first thought was mountain lion, which I always have at the back of my mind. 
they're all over the place out here, but they usually clear out long before they let people, let alone a person with a dog, get this close to them. Figured that probably wasn't it. Whatever, I thought. We've got to cross this goalie and keep moving. So I patted the dog on the head and kept on moving down toward the bottom of the goalie. Reggie stayed right on my heels the entire time. The bottom of the goalie was a dry creek bed loaded with car-sized boulders with a lot of rocks and gravel running between the rock formations and steep grassy walls of the goalie. As I was crunching over the gravel, Reggie stopped in the middle of the creek bed and, once again, was fixated on something to our left down the goalie. This time he dropped his spine and I could see his hackles raise. Oh shit, I thought. Maybe there really is some kind of predator in the rocks down there. I flipped the safety off my shotgun and started talking to Reggie in the cute buddy tone I use when I'm trying to calm him down. I started walking toward a big boulder in the middle of the creek bed that was blocking my view. Looked like once I was past it, I'd have a clear field of view over the entire goalie, all the way down the valley's side to the river. Reggie was still frozen in place. I patted his head as I passed on his right side. Once I got a few paces past him, I noticed he wasn't following me, which he usually would, even if it was a bear ahead of us. I looked back at him. Let's go, bud. What's up there? Let's go get it. Usual comments I'd make to him to get him all jazzed and excited to go check out an area. He started pacing around in half circles again, with his ears back and his tail down. What the fuck? I thought. Definitely never seen him do this before, unless, again, we're at the vet and he doesn't like shots. I've seen him chase 400 pound black bears off my property and squabble with countless coyotes. He's not scared of much. This got me pretty anxious. I shouldered my shotgun and decided that before we keep moving, at this point, checking behind the boulder where something had the dog all tweaked out was a safe thing to do. I moved fast. In my experience, dealing with cougars and black bears, 99.9% .9 of the time you bump into one, they're absolutely terrified and run away as fast as they possibly can, especially when surprised by something with confident movement that's making lots of noise. But definitely, don't do this with a grizzly. I heard Reggie start following me as I started to boogie around the boulder. I came around the big rock on the right side, and in front of me was a big clearing in the creek bed and a huge big horn sheep, a ram, no more than 25 feet in front of me. We run into a big horn sheep out in this country all the time, so it wasn't that much of a surprise. What was surprising was how this thing was sitting. That's the only way I can think to describe it. And it was sitting on its folded back legs like a dog or a cat would holding itself up with a straight-backed posture, front legs locked forward with its hooves in the gravel, staring straight ahead so I couldn't see its face. What the fuck? I said out loud. These are very wary and skittish animals. They'd never let a person get this close. A bunch of things went through my mind at the same time. Maybe it's dead. No, it was cold, and I could see steam coming from its slow breaths. Maybe it's wounded and dying? Maybe it's stuck on some old fencing or something. Right then, Reggie started barking. Not just barking, but snarl barking, like he was in a fight. He's a pretty quiet dog generally, and he never barks at deer, elk or ram. Maybe prances after them for a few seconds instinctively. If we bump into one hiking and spook it, but he's never been very interested in big mammals. It startled me. I looked back at him, and he had his front legs splayed out, his head was down, his tail was down, his hackles were raised up so high he didn't even look like an English setter anymore, and he was fully baring his teeth and barking and snarling like I've never seen before. He looked feral, like a coyote. I could hear the snap of his teeth as he barked again and again. I looked back at the ram, still just sitting there unmoving, staring straight ahead. Now that was strange. I've never known a wild mammal to do anything but bolt away, terrified at the presence of a canine, 
let alone not even move a muscle with a canine being aggressive. I was pretty convinced at that point that the ram had to be real sick or super messed up in some way. Definitely close to death. Even if it was tangled up on something or had got trapped in a leg snare, it would be freaking the hell out with the dog going ballistic next to it the way Reggie was. Reggie, here! I yelled to him. Here is sort of my catch-all command for him, meaning stop what you're doing and get to my heels right now. Reggie didn't even look at me. I took my shotgun in my left hand, turned and took a step toward the dog, and pointed at the ground in front of me, and pretty much screamed, Reggie, here! Again, nothing. He just kept barking and snarling at the ram with increasing intensity. That really put me on edge. He never just completely ignored a firm command before. It's like I wasn't even there. I turned back to the ram and shouldered my shotgun again. Something was wrong, real wrong. All my years spent in the back country, hunting and tracking big game animals. I mean, I literally guided ram hunts professionally just one valley over, and I'd never seen anything like this. The wind was picking up and howling down the gully. I felt its bite on my hands. The light dusting of snow from the night before was getting whipped up around the gully. Thin, frantic sheets and clouds of light snow that looked almost like electric bursts as the tiny ice crystals catch the light at different times. I started moving around the ram to its right, trying to gain some elevation to stay somewhat above it as I rounded its position to get a look at its face. Bighorn sheep don't attack people. They're skittish as hell, so I wasn't necessarily scared of that. But this thing seemed unwell, so I figured all bets were off. As I was sidestepping around it, the wind in the goalie started messing with the pressure in my ears, as it can. Felt like I was landing in an airplane, and my ears popping slightly dulled the volume of Reggie's snarling and barking, and the wind howling down around the rocks. My heart was pounding pretty good at this point. I got to a spot around eight feet directly to its right and about three to four feet above it up the slope of the goalie and could start to make out its face. My heart rate was going insane, uniquely so to the point I actually noticed. The pressure change made it so I could hear my heartbeat thundering in my ears and I feel it throbbing in my cheeks and eyes. Felt like I'd taken 10 Adderall, chugged a Red Bull and then sprinted a mile. Trying to calm myself down and get a grip only made me more jumpy and anxious. I took another step and could see its mouth now. It was slightly agape, with milky snot running from its nose and saliva dripping from its bottom lip, with little spurts and flecks of both shooting out every time it exhaled a steamy breath. What? I kept saying out loud. I took another step and could start to see its eyes behind the big, full curls of its horns, which were pocked with scars and abrasions from a lifetime of battling other rams and existing in this hard, rocky country. I took another step, so I was able to essentially look at it from the front for the first time and see its full features. It had tears pouring out of its eyes, and it sounded almost like it was moaning. All right, I thought. This thing is incredibly messed up. Is it a virus or something? Is its lower spine broken? I wanted to put it out of its misery, but shooting a bighorn sheep without a license is a felony with a $15,000 fine. So I started thinking about hiking back and calling the fish and game officers. I lowered my shotgun and was about to turn to go back toward the dog when it snapped its head up to the right and looked right at me. Until my last day alive, I will never forget that moment. All the wind was knocked out of me, or sucked out of me. It felt like I was free-falling, with my stomach in my throat. I couldn't move. I pissed myself. Just straight up urinated in my pants for the first time since I was a toddler. Tears started rolling out of my eyes down my cheeks. My hands and feet went numb. I didn't notice the dog move. But Reggie was suddenly right at my feet, with a strap for my backpack in his mouth, fiercely pulling on it as hard as he could, as though we were playing a tug-of-war, yanking me back the way I'd come. But 
but I couldn't move. I couldn't raise my shotgun. I couldn't look away from the ram. I was stuck. Then the ram started weeping. That's the only way I can describe it. Weeping. It didn't move its body, only its head, but it was whimpering and weeping, like a person. Its facial features became very human. Its eyes bulged. Its bottom lip was quivering. It was whimpering out noises like it was trying to speak between sobs, while sucking in air sporadically, like a crying child would. Then, unmistakably, it started speaking, or more like it started pleading. It only used a total of three different words, but they were unmistakable. Don't go. Don't go. Please don't go. Don't go. Don't go. Please don't go. Don't. It increased its intensity gradually, from a whimpering pleading to a desperate screaming. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I felt like I was going to throw up, or had already thrown up. After what felt about 15 seconds, my dog finally yanked on my pack hard enough to get me to stumble, and I lost my footing. I couldn't move my leg to replace my foot, so I went down to one knee and then buckled forward down the slope rolling onto a shoulder and finally breaking my eye contact with the ram. The second I broke eye contact with that thing, I could breathe again, and the sensation of falling went away. Reggie was whining and barking now, right in my face, licking my cheek between barks and snapping at the straps on my backpack shoulder straps and yanking on me away from where I'd fallen. I pushed myself up on my palms and just screamed, Go! to the dog and grabbed my shotgun and half sprinted, half crawled up the hill out of the goalie as fast as I could. The ram's screaming was getting louder. It started to hurt my ears. Reggie was ahead of me, stopping every 20 feet or so to look at me and bark toward the noise. I could see the dog was shaking like a leaf. The screaming started to turn into a single unbroken roar that sounded half beast and half wind. The pressure in my head was so bad that a throbbing reddish blackness flooded my peripheral vision and I could barely see. I just kept crawling and scrambling toward my dog's barking and eventually crossed the crest of the slope at the top of the gully and was on flat ground again atop the valley ridge. Right then, the roaring stopped. The wind died down and I felt the pressure in my head give way. The darkness faded from my vision, and the light of the day filled the world again. I stood up and jogged a short distance until a thirst like I had never felt came over me. I collapsed at the base of a rock outcropping and called Reggie over. I took probably 25 gulps of water out of my camelback. I realized I'd thrown up all over myself at some point while scrambling out of the goalie, or maybe before, and had a few deep cuts in my palms and knuckles. Reggie was still shaking like he'd just come out of an ice bath and whining as though he was hurt. I checked him for injuries, but he seemed all right. So I gave him some water and put an arm around him trying to calm him down just a bit. I wiped much of the dirt and snow caked vomit off my coat as I could with my bandana while keeping an eye and a shotgun bale trained on the crest of the goalie, expecting with a deep dread to see ram horns slowly coming over the crest, but they didn't. After a minute or so, I got my step together. I took another sip of water, stood up and booked it the entire three miles or so back to the truck, jogging the entire way. As soon as I could see my truck, I fumbled my keys out of my coat pocket, unlocked it, and bolted straight for the driver's side door. I threw the dog into the passenger seat the gun into the back seat and piled in behind the wheel without even taking my pack off. Fired her up and tore down the dirt road much faster than was safe. I got to the highway and didn't stop until we were in my driveway. It's been two weeks since that day and I still haven't been able to sleep a full night or talk to anyone about it. The hell would I tell people without them thinking I've lost my mind? Reggie has never liked sleeping in my bed before but he's curled up as close as he can to me every night since. 
I have no way to rationally explain what happened out there. I have no clue what it was controlling or possessing that animal. But I know one thing. It felt like there was a person in that ram. Somewhere. It felt like a person's spirit was stuck in there and desperately wanted out. However, based on the way my dog was acting, I also got the gut feeling that, if I did help it, I wouldn't have ever left that goalie. I am sincerely terrified in a way I've never known possible. I was headed home from work at around 11 p.m. or later. I remember it was a bit on the cool side. I believe it was late fall or early winter. I was not far from the old sanitation department off the highway when I caught with my headlights a large upright creature that straddled the fence without missing a beat. The fence was near a ditch and the fence was still about four feet high. The closest homes were only about a half mile down the road. This was mostly intersecting fields. A blonde Bigfoot is the closest I can get to describing what I saw that night. It made me so scared that it took hours to calm down when getting back to an empty house. I grew up on the farm and love hiking to this day. I am very observant and in my life I have seen more than a few mountain lions, white squirrels and even a black deer, so I pay attention and get out a lot. I have never been able to convince myself it was anything else. It was upright and appeared to be a dark blonde color in my headlights, and very fast. I think I've had an experience and I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Me and my friend were walking towards a park to go hang out, and then we discovered this sewer system. We decided to check it out because we were stupid. There was a grate covering it, but the bars were bent open, enough that me and her could squeeze in. She had a really bad feeling about it. She's a super intuitive person when it comes to paranormal stuff, but I just ignored it further and went in. There was a big room area that the grate led into, and it had a grate on the top where light was shining through. There was a big tunnel leading right, and a small tunnel up high that I couldn't reach on the left. The room was partially filled with water at the bottom, and there was some graffiti on the walls of the tunnels. As I looked to the left, it was super dark, so I couldn't see very well. But a long ways down, there was another grate, and there was some light leaking in. I could see a long, lanky thing stretched out that looked like a really skinny arm. I couldn't see a body because it was further closer to me where it was darker, and I could only see it because it was in front of the light, so it was shining behind it and made it pop out. Sorry if this is worded weird, I don't know how else to describe it. It looked like an arm stretched out, and it wasn't moving. I ignored it, thinking it was probably just a plank of wood or something propped up, because there were some planks of wood in the room I was in. I decided to stack some rocks by the left tunnel so that I could reach it and look in. As I looked through the tunnel, there was another room far down the tunnel, and it had a grate on top like my room. The light was leaking in. Then I noticed this gray hunched over figure with an extremely bony body. It didn't have any clothes on or hair from what I could see. Its body looked super malnourished. I couldn't see its head or its legs since the tunnel was really small. All I could really see was its back, part of its neck and the tops of its arms. It also wasn't moving and by this point I was freaking out. I went back to my friend and told her what I saw. I asked her for her phone so I could take a picture to show her, since she refused to go in there herself. I took the picture and then we hightailed it out of there. I sadly don't have the picture because the phone it was taken on had gotten lost. We have gone back a couple of times but never saw anything like it since. The tunnels were just empty. I think the figure were either crawlers or greys, maybe. If anyone has any information on greys, please let me know. I can't find much about them. Sorry if this is badly worded, it's pretty late. If anyone needs me to elaborate on something, I'd be happy to do so. Anyone have any idea what it is or have anything similar happen to them? Oh, a quick update for you. 
My friend that was just there at the time just told me some more information about the sewers. The sewers connect to the army depot that is around in the area where they do testing on animals. Maybe this is one of the test subjects. I've had strange experiences since I was a kid, but this was definitely the most terrifying one. I had been living in the Middle East for about four years at that time. I got back from work one night, had dinner, watched TV and went to bed after midnight. I hadn't fallen asleep yet. I'm 100% sure I was awake and aware of everything around me. I was just lying in bed, on my side, one hand under the pillow, facing the edge of the bed, and thinking about what had to be done the next day, when I felt something warm near me. The same way you can feel the warmth of a body very close to you, even though it isn't touching you. This thing didn't touch me. It started breathing deeply, so close to my neck I could feel its warm breath on my skin. And it spoke. I can immediately identify the Arabic language, even though I can't speak it. But this thing didn't speak Arabic. It was something else. Similar, but something else. And it wasn't like this had lips or even a physical body. For the way it spoke, it's like a voice came directly from the creature's throat and sounded like a growl. Very guttural. My reaction was instinctive. I remember the fear I felt down my spine and the scream that I let out. I just kicked and punched in the air, pushing myself away from that thing. I was up in a flash and turned the light on. There was nothing there. Of course, my heart was racing. I was scared to death and I couldn't stop crying. I had to turn the TV on and watch silly cartoons till the sun came up. Later on, I told my partner at the time, he's a Muslim, and he was convinced it was a jinn. I'm not a religious person, but I do believe there's more out there than just the things our senses can feel. I have another story from when I was very young. It's not related, but friends also think I have encountered another jinn. If your fan base is interesting, I could also share that experience. Has anyone experienced a similar occurrence?